Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, my dear brothers, sisters, viewers, and friends of Ikra TV. Welcome to another edition of Real Talk. With this part, the first part of the program, I've been talking to a really interesting brother, Asif Angunwala. I mean, you know, as I said at the beginning of the program, a man that I met about a year and a half ago, and since that moment, <laughs> I've been inspired by him, by his inspirational sort of background, his zest, zest and zeal for life, and his dedication, commitment to entrepreneurship. And he's shown, he's proved himself to be a phenomenal entrepreneur, building a number of businesses. At the moment, obviously, your interest is around properties and asset management, et cetera, yes. et cetera. Yes. So you move from manufacturing to asset management. But you come back into manufacturing because you're now looking at setting up or have already set up already set a, a, the starter yes. of what you call a, a halal burger uh, manufacturing. Well, Can it's, you just explain that, please? Uh, yes. So, so about six, seven years ago, these two boys came to me and wanted to wanted an investment in their uh, in their halal brand. Right. So, I told them that uh, obviously they must feel I had only met them once, and they came to me to ask me for money. I said I must have maybe stupid <laughs> written on my forehead or something. <laughs> Anyways, cut a long story short. Seven years on. Uh, we created a company called Haludis, right. Halal Foodies. Right. We made it into Haludis. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. And my initial reaction was when I looked into the halal food market here, I found that one is countries like Germany and France had much bigger markets in mm -hmm. the billions, whereas the UK was still very much under under the under the water as term in terms of sales and the size of the market. Uh, we went into, we are a secondary supplier, not a primary supplier. Right. A primary supplier generally is somebody who slaughters the animal. Right. We actually take the slaughtered animal and we take parts of it and then we do the secondary processing and which means we do the finishing. Yeah, you, you make okay. the burgers. We make the burgers <coughs> yeah. or we or we or we or we pack the chicken in certain sizes in certain forms, mm. whether they are wings or they are leg or they are thigh or their breast, and we pack it in certain sizes for certain parties. Uh, our objective was the uh, food services market. Mm. Uh, if you go to any restaurant and you ask them for halal one, first of all, most of them don't even understand what is halal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and secondly, as I said, the availability is not there. Even though I would say 85% of all chicken in the UK is halal. Mm -hmm. Now, even in the halal, as in our community, as you know, Iqbal, why, yeah. you know, we have a difference of opinion, right? Definitely. definitely. Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, 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 there are two different throats, whether it's slaughtered properly or not slaughtered properly. Yeah, stunned or non-stunned. Stunned or non-stunned, non yeah, yeah, that yeah. is the word for it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that all these issues are there because of your beliefs. Mm -hmm. But uh, having spoken to quite a few wise people, because, and I must say this, and I'm not afraid to say it, that before this, I was not a halal eater. Achha. Okay, uh, You know, I, I considered it that, yes, it's, it's something that, as a good Muslim, you should be eating, but nobody really emphasized it, so I wasn't emphasized, emphasizing on it. But since I've got into the business, of course, I have, and a lot of my friends ask me, that, oh, but before this, so I said, well, if you're making a mistake, there's nothing wrong in correcting the exactly. mistake. Allah maaf karne wala. Allah maaf karne wala. Exactly, yes. And what, uh, what I want to, what I, my belief is that after having worked in this business and, and read up a lot about halal and how it works and everything, look, halal is a personal requirement. Uh, I think we have been ordained by God, that uh, by Allah, that, look, if you're going to serve meat, then make sure it's halal. Mm. And what is the reason for it? The reasoning behind it is that the blood in the animal is the largest carrier of bacteria mm -hmm. and disease. So the more you remove from the, uh, from, the, from the animal once you slaughter it, the better the chances are that you will not pick up any kind of disease yes. or bacteria. So again, as I said, I think it's one of those things God has ordered us to do. And I'm not questioning other people's halal qualifications, but as I said, I'm pure halal because one is I'm a Muslim. I have a so conscious. Uh, nothing in the factory goes through which is not for the halal market. Mm. And nothing comes into it that's so not halal. You know, I mean, like you say, there are 
two schools of thought. Yeah, two schools of which thought. Which is one is stunned and stunned, non-stunned. No, so which non-stunned. method do you sort of uh, use in your We are basically chain? using stunned right. because, again, that's the general market, I think, from an, uh, you know, in, 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 of course, this is my own logic behind. And, and because I'm a businessman and I'm practical, I have to use logic. Mm-hmm. When you are supplying, you know, 50 people with food, Yes, doing it in the in the in the unstunned way is the right way. It's possible, but, yeah. but it's possible Log- to do logistically. It, right? It's difficult. Logistically, it's yeah. impossible to service fifteen million people mm. by doing uh, unstunned. Okay, right. it's just not practical. Number one, number two, uh, if I can give an industry background on this, when you when you uh, do zaba or do the slaughter of a chicken, and if it is if it is uh, uh, if it is not stunned then what happens is the breakage in the in the bones of the wings and the legs and all of that is so high mm. that a lot of the product can, gets wasted right okay so therefore it makes it easier to in in from an industry point of view it makes it easier to keep the chicken whole and in one piece by stunning it and mm-hmm. then doing the slaughter. So, look, again, I think that's a matter of belief. And, yeah, personal. And, and it's a personal and I, choice. And I know a lot of ulama have said that yeah. the stunning process is acceptable because when they stun the animal... They're still alive. They're still, still conscious. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. look, you know, God, God in his wisdom was very smart. Mm. Humans, as human beings, we are just starting to become smart, right? Mm. So, you know, when, when he talked about the whole objective is... It's a scientific reason that the blood must be drained. And the Prophet allows him, and Allah commanded this. You know, and he he put it in his own years. way. Exactly. We, you know, we uh, at least I don't read Arabic, so you know, when I say my prayers, most of it I don't understand. Now I have become wiser. I read up in English what it mm-hmm. said. But again, as I said, I think, I think it's it's about niyat. Niyat is the most important thing yeah. in this, and that's why I go back to. Uh, saying between not challenging other people's halal methods and being pure because as I said I'm doing this for myself mm. I'm not doing it for anybody mm. else and I think that is the You're, you want your conscious to be clear my conscious if I'm going to supply meat mm. to Muslim or even non-Muslims it must be halal mm. there is no other way around so, so anyways going forward with this yeah. I have uh, I, I have two areas uh, I want to go into the f- uh, food services market which we have now been successful at, at bringing in one or two of the really, really large distribution companies. Yeah. And we want to go into retail, which is ready to eat. And products that are available for, uh, you know, single moms or families that uh, where, the, where the husband and the wife are both working mm. and they still want to give their children a proper meal, good healthy, a good meal. healthy meal, and I think that's the area that we will be concentrating on. Inshallah, may Allah give you strength. Inshallah, I, I, I wish we had longer time yeah. to talk. Can we can we ch- change the subject a little yes. bit from business to your philanthropy? I mean, your British Pakistani Foundation and your aspire and mentorship programs. Can mm. you give us a little sort of uh, flavor what they yeah. are? So, uh, first of all, it's not mine. It's a public charitable body that I, uh, you know, for my sins. <laughs> I got involved with it because when it was started in 2010, <coughs> at that time, Shah Mahmood Qureshi had just launched the APF in the U.S., the American Pakistan Foundation. All oh, right. And in those days, if you remember, uh, Iqbal, why there used to be a lot. You know, you get these ticker tape at the end, bottom of CNN or BBC, mm-hmm. where they they report about. You know, and every other day you had something to do with Pakistan and terrorism. So it was a it was an organization which originally started with the, uh, you know, with with communicating to the rest of the world that look, we are not such bad people, right? Not we all are, of us. Not all of us, and we are we had in 99.9% ninety nine point nine ninety nine point nine percent are good people. people. That mm. we do have every every country has that element, and and we are nobody to spare. But we were getting a lot of attention negative Mm. attention so it was about doing a good job and communicating to the especially to the uk public and to the europeans that look we're not so bad Mm. so it was one year into it by 2011 uh, myself and shahid azim and one or two others who were on the board realized that this was not you know how was it helping the british pakistani Mm. okay Uh, you know as they say you you must help first yourself before you can help others mm. 
And if our market was to be in eventuality the socio-economic development of Pakistan, well, where would the funding come from? Okay. And the, to be fair to the UK government, they, gave, they were giving and still do give Pakistan a lot of funds mm. for <coughs> good causes in education and women's welfare and so on and so forth. But you need the diaspora, which from the UK, from what I understand, you know, sends about $12 billion a year back to Pakistan, just from the UK diaspora. That's <coughs> quite, quite a substantial amount. Yeah, that's it? a substantial amount. Very substantial amount. And, and because it's such a high amount, mm. it, the channeling of it wasn't always correct, okay? Right. Or people sent it to their own people. But, you know, Pakistan, British Pakistanis have done extremely well in the UK. Mm -hmm. due to the policies of the government and, and, and the dedication of the individuals themselves who've worked so hard to get to where they are, they were all looking for a route to send money. So we've got a lot of medical organizations and we've got many organizations. Lots of charities, yeah. Lots of charities yeah, and yeah. the BPF looked at it. So at one stage when we did a calculation, there were like 1,700 uh, charities established of which maybe about 10% of them were operating, okay? So every time there was a disaster in Pakistan, you would get, you would make this charity and they would send that money once and then it was over. Mm. So the role of the BPF became more to supplement the efforts of other British Pakistani organizations. Mm. Where do you need, where is it that they are not, where other organizations are not concentrating, that's where we come into play. Right, right. But the ultimate motive that we had after two, three years of being established was that there is no, there is no political base for British Pakistanis. At the mm. end of the day, if we are, if they say we are, but we're still not sure what the number is, it goes from 1.2 to 2.2 million. Well, I don't know where it is. I mean, that's a 50% gap right mm, there. Huge so, gap. And see, you don't, if we don't even know mm. that, then we are in trouble. I would assume that the, the, the British Pakistani population is anywhere between 1.7 million and 2.1 million, mm. okay? Which is a lot. And these are British Pakistanis. That means born, born in, in Britain, this country, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Like my children are. Okay. Mm. And one of the questions that came up all those years ago was, well, who's going to look after their interests? Okay. Mm. So small things like, you know, when we have a death in the family, according to our religious rights, we would like to bury them the same day. Mm. But you need a coroner certificate, which is nothing wrong because those are the laws of this land. Yes. Now, having 14,000 plus doctors in this country, if I can't get a coroner's certificate the same mm. day, then I need to look at what I'm doing wrong. Yes. Okay. So it's small issues like this or, you know. The day-to-day -day issues that affect people's lives. That affect people's lives who still, uh, they might be born here and they live here. But, you know, we still have our ethnic traditions. Mm. Why should we leave them? Nobody yeah, leaves their ethnicity. Should be right? proud of our we should be proud of it, yeah. but we should also be proud that, yes, we are British. Yes, we are English or Welsh or Scottish or whatever it is. So you have to carry those also. Mm. So it was a question of integration. Mm. And, and, and I think to a great extent, I think the British Pakistanis have integrated, but, but without, in a democracy, the only thing that matters, Iqbal Bhai, is the vote. Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. You know, and it doesn't look like we exercise our votes in totally, the correct Totally agree way. with you. Totally okay? agree with you. Yes. So BPF became more and more of a th place where we were trying to say that, look, it's a platform for British Pakistanis to come together mm -hmm. to voice their issues, whether they be for jobs, whether they be for mentoring, whether they be for you know, the human, the, the, as I was mentioning to you about the prisoners that mm. we have in, in jail, right? Of course, in this case, we switched to Muslims, almost 20 to 22 percent of the prisoners in, in, in jails in the UK are, f are from this ethnic community, mm. right? Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, mm. and, and, and so, you know, why and who is standing up and fighting their cause mm -hmm. or their cases? And as you mentioned, you know, for a TV license, no payment if you're put into jail, well, that, that really, really doesn't fly. Mm. So again, if there was an organization like BPF who had the support of the community, then we could actually take these matters up at the right places, mm. okay? And after 10 years of pushing water uphill, uh, I'm not giving up, but 
you know, I, I mean, one of the reasons to come on to your show today was to appeal to the community at large to say, look, you know, if you, if you don't step up to the plate, mm -hmm. then, you know, I'm one person. I cannot do it on my own. There are a few others who have put their lot in with this. And it's not about funding. It's about support from the community in general. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, bye bye. If you don't mind, I'm going to use your program just to say that. Look, in two years' time, hopefully there'll be an election. Yes, definitely. I think uh, it's unfortunate that we have only 14 members in the parliament. Or we should. Be, I've been saying this for a very long time, sir. <coughs> we should be. I, I'm. I'm making a plea today to the younger people who, mm -hmm. if you are watching, that look, if you have political ambition. Please write to Iqbal Bhai. He will forward it to me. You can write to me yourself yeah. as Brit Brit at the British Pakistan Foundation. You can Google it. You'll find it immediately. Uh, write to us because we would really like to identify five, eight, ten candidates who then we would work with to find them support mm. from within the community and say, look, we're bringing you to the front, right? You can be Labour. You can be Conservative. You can be Lib Dem. You can be Independent. But one theme should run across all of them that is about the community okay of, of and british Islam, pakistanis and Muslim, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that is something that i've spoke as as my viewers will you know if they could ring in and tell you that i've been saying this for for many many years yeah. that the muslim community in this country is substantial enough to control well, or or manage 100 parliamentary seats in the house of commons anybody who's got access to 100 parliamentary members <laughs> they control whatever happens as you and I mean Asiba is also very highly engaged in other activities and as you know he's a fellow of the Duke of Edinburgh Award, trustee of the Whitfield Development Trust and the chairman of the World Memon Foundation as well and he didn't know this but I can speak the language a little <laughs> yes, bit. I just sort of suddenly because I was born in Africa I grew up yeah. with Memons and Kachis all my life. So he speaks I, it better I, than me by no, the way. No, I, I, I mean, I, I've relearned it. <laughs> Asiba I mean thank you for coming. No. Unfortunately we're running out of time. I would love to sit here for hours and hours, and I'm sure some, if not all, of most of my viewers would want to hear much more about you. We never got around to Aspire Mentorship, but you made a very valid point about anybody who wants to get involved in the power politics of this world. You know, if they're interested in getting into the, the political Thank arena, yes. then obviously the British Pakistani Foundation is one avenue where people can get in touch and get some support and mentorship, et cetera, et cetera, which is something that is really needed in our community. We want our young men and women yeah. to aspire to a higher station than we have at this moment in time. I hope, my brothers and sisters, you've enjoyed this evening's program. I'm sure I would want to do another one over in the next few months with Asibai. In the meantime, take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah be with you and may he protect you and keep you safe and sound. I'll see you next week, inshallah, as soon as I can. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Iqbal.